Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The bear and the dragon. Over the last few years, the Russia-China relationship has grown in depth and in magnitude. It is not hard to understand why. With Russia constantly demonized and sanctioned, and China targeted as a serious Western security threat, it is no wonder Moscow and Beijing gravitate towards each other. This is much more than a marriage of convenience. Crosstalking Russia and China, I'm joined by my guests, Joel Rue in Paris. He is the president of the Bridge Tank. In Washington, we have Earl Rasmussen. He is the executive vice president of the Eurasia Center. And in Singapore, we cross to Jim Rogers. He's an international investor and author of Street Smarts, Adventures on the Road and in the Markets. All right, Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Jim, let me go to you in Singapore. As I said in my introduction, this is no longer a marriage of convenience if it ever was. Um, the reason why we're doing this program is I'm is reflecting upon an uh, op-ed in the in New York Times, and they were basically reacting as like, wow, did anybody notice this happening, which all of us have, and remarkably said that Trump was right to improve relations with Russia, essentially to do a reverse Nixon when it came to China. What, what are these people talking about? Where have they been? It seems like they've just crawled out under from a rock. Go ahead, Jim, in Singapore. But I will tell you, Peter, if you go to Moscow Airport now, it's full of Chinese. Five years ago, there were nobody there. If you go to Red Square, they're all speaking Chinese. Uh, Mr. Trump and the Americans are pushing the Chinese and the Russians closer and closer together. It breaks my heart. I'm an American. But this is insane. It's insane. If you can get out a map or study demography or geography, you will know you don't want to be against those two countries combined. Okay, well, very good point. Joe, let me go to you in Paris. I mean, this has been going on slowly but surely for a variety of reasons here. Of course, Russia um, is against NATO expansion. It sees it as an uh, existential threat to, uh, to its security, which it is. Any military alliance moving towards your borders is, by definition. And the Chinese, well, we see that the United States, again, uh, raising the issue of tariffs and possible sanctions, Chinese um, interaction with a country like Iran. I mean, China and Russia our natural allies in light in reacting to the um, uh, policies coming out of Washington. And it doesn't really matter who's in the White House, by the way. Go ahead in Paris. Yeah, you know, I think uh, there are two ways of being friends. Either you have the same enemies, you share the same enemies. Uh, but I'm not sure it's what matters the most, you know. Of course, this has fueled the friendship. But I think that the second way, which is to have uh, common issues, is more important. And I would suggests that Central Asia and growingly the Middle East is shared issues between the mm. two nations, uh, both economically, uh, energetically, and in terms of security. So I think it's a friendship which is going to last. Earl, same question to you. This is much more than a marriage convenience, because that's what you constantly hear. That is the refrain when it comes to uh, Western observers watching Russia and China. I mean, I think it's gone way beyond that. I mean, it's gone way beyond dating. They're in a relationship. They will probably never get married, okay, because neither country uh, under its own uh, uh, laws can be, uh, be part of a strategic alliance with another country. But they certainly do parlay very well. Go ahead, Earl. Uh, yes, Peter. It's, I mean, it's been happening for a while, and uh, and just to be surprised, recently it's kind of, you know, where have you been? Uh, but absolutely, it's more than just a marriage of convenience. It's going much deeper. Uh, also, which couples it and makes it even stronger uh, is a personal relationship between President Xi and uh, President Putin, which basically they they call each other their best friends, uh, and that spills over into government and. We've got uh, natural, uh, which we've kind of talked about a little bit, the Central Asia, I think, piece is very critical, especially to support the Belt and Road Initiative. And we've got, uh, Russia's got an abundance of resources, China needs resources, but it's much more than just economic, uh, and we've got 2,600 mile uh, border. Uh, the relationships are going much deeper, Ge geopolitical interests, uh, personal interests, economic, uh, and now potential military security uh, interests as well. 
You know, Jim, one of the things that's very interesting is that uh, I, uh, detractors of the Russia-China relationship always say that Russia is choosing poorly. It should choose the West over China. But I always counter is that uh, uh, under that scenario, Russia must surrender a great deal of its sovereignty and that it is unwilling to do that. Its relationship with China, both countries preserve their, their sovereignty and they're very adamant about it. I mean, if you look at their relationship, one is not subservient to the other. They have mutual strong interests and that's where they start from. Go ahead, Jim. They have huge interests together. They have the Russians have vast natural resources. The Chinese have vast amounts of labor. The Russians need uh, labor, and the Chinese need natural resources. Siberia used to be part of uh, China, you know. Uh, it's only in the past 150 years or so that Siberia became part of Russia. The Russians. Well, you know the history, I'm sure. So, no, this is, makes perfectly natural sense. It's going to be good for both countries. Again, I'm an American. I don't particularly like it. I don't like seeing what's happened. But, no, it's fabulous for everybody. The Russians get what they need. The Chinese get what they need. And if you look at a map, nobody wants to fight those countries. It's a, two and a, half, it's a, a billion and a half people, vast borders. I mean, you'd have to be crazy to... <laughs> build enemies with those two people. Well, Jim, they, they, there's been a lot of craziness in Washington. Think of Iraq, okay? Think of Libya. Think of Syria. I mean, don't put it past these people here, okay? Seriously. Well, Joel, it's not yeah. just, uh, Peter, you're exactly right. Politicians all over the world throughout history have done some unbelievably foolish things. America's doing them now, but don't, don't think others won't do them too. Okay, Joel, Joel, I mean, what is the possibility of a, a reverse Nixon, okay? Because this is what, you know, this, the New York Times recently has talked about it, encouraging Donald Trump to in better relations with Russia after what the media and, and, the, and his political opposition, the Democrats, have done for the last three years. And now the liberal old lady, gray lady, comes out and says, Mr. Trump, you should improve, improve relations. I mean, I don't even think Russia would even shake a, a hand extended at this point. And I I think that that's one, one, a primary reason they say we have to look east. I mean, it's, it's common sense. Joel, like, go ahead in Paris. Well, you know, uh, Nixon that time came with his own terms and they were understandable and agreeable. I think that it goes much beyond that today that uh, Trump and America today wouldn't have their own terms. I really appreciated what Earl said from Washington when he mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, what the two countries, what China and Russia, could do to get back to them quickly, they share in common is not just quantum interest in resources and labor, they share an interest in securing some land, in developing some land, in developing the hinterland of Central Asia and, and, uh, and the Middle East, as I said, which are areas which have been blind spots for the U.S. under many governments. Uh, they've been under the highlights, of course, for security reasons, but not for economic paradigms. Yeah. So I think that today, whether uh, the White House would want or not to shake hands, to extend a hand to Russia, or be back to extend a hand to, to China in a few years from now, it's no longer just about quantums, about trade, about quantities, about finance. It's about having a shared geostrategic vision and development vision, which uh, is not very much present in Washington DC these days, I think. So uh, maybe the US don't have the means of their policies, whichever is the policy. Jim, you want to jump, jump in? Go ahead, Jim, jump how in. Can you, how can Washington suddenly become friends with the, with the Russians? The previous Republican candidate for president said many times, Russia is our deepest, bright, most powerful, and most dangerous enemy. This is, you know, a guy who was running for president before Trump. Many people in Congress sit there and say, like in lunatics, we've got to fight the Russians. They're a terrible, terrible enemy. The Russians are not an enemy of the United States. We should be doing everything we can with them. And we should be with the Chinese. The people in Washington have no clue about the world. Okay, I see, Earl, you're nodding your head in agreement. Why? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think China and Russia are not enemies of the U.S., whatever. Maybe they are, they're, they're challenges on the economic side uh, with China. Well, that's competition. Uh, that's global competition. global hegemon hegemony. That's but competition. Absolutely. It's competition. And I think China, China and Russia are both open to partnership 
uh, with the U.S. They're not anti the U.S., but they want their own uh, their their own vision, and they have a shared, I think, shared geopolitical economic development vision uh, for the world, not just for Central Asia, but. And I think they're working that closely together, and I think other countries realize that they respect them as well. So I, I think this is a dangerous path for the U.S. to go, and I think we need some policy shakeup to realize mm -hmm. that, hey, both these leaders are pragmatic. They realize yeah. the U.S. is very influential, and I think they want to work with the U.S. Uh, Okay, well, Joe, I mean, like, the problem but is... But it's it, not one versus the other. Well, it, but that's what it gets down to in Washington. I mean, again, it, Washington wants hegemony, okay? I see that R Russia and China vis-a-vis -vis the United States want, uh, at, at the very least, peaceful coexistence. But going back to, you know, what, what Jim is saying, you know, I mean, it, it's either one way or the other. That is not going to work now because China and Russia to collectively together are way too powerful. And as I always like to stress to people, they have resources and they can, they have options, okay? It's something that they don't have to automatically accept from Washington. Go ahead, Joel, in Paris. No, you know, the U.S. have been great in history at having one enemy, but I'm not sure they would be double as great at, as having two enemies, you know, and, and I agree completely with what Earl was saying, that, that they can't afford that. Do, is there a shared vision? I don't know. As an economist, I would put it two ways. First of all, on resources, there will be a competition. There will be a growing competition. So it's about the perception seen from D.C. on how much the U.S. can adjust to the shared, uh, so, sorry, to the increase, the rising competition for resources, for global resources. But the second views would be in the future. I think the U.S. is still a very dynamic, very inventive, uh, technology-driven uh, society. And it would be for the genius of the American people and the American nation to express confidence in their own future. Well, that I, I, have to jump in here. I have to jump in here, gentlemen. We have, to go to a hard, we have to go to a hard break here. Oh, the American people have ingenuity. They just have bad leaders. After a short break, we'll continue our discussion on Russia and China. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To, rem to remind you, we're discussing Russia and China. Okay, let's go back to Earl in Washington. You've mentioned Central Asia already twice on this program. I think it's really important and instructive for our viewers to understand is that when the Soviet Union came to an end, Boris Yeltsin, probably the only good foreign policy decision he ever made, was to work with China to make sure that there would be stability in Central Asia, where there would not be overt strategic competition. And that was a, a, a genius move, because that started the process of this bilateral relationship to develop, where they decided, we're going to work together, we're not going to compete over Central Asia. The reason why I bring this up is that, again, you know, the, the, the uh, quote-unquote axis of Beijing in Moscow, they are abhorrent to Western values. But what I find very interesting is I don't see Russia or China under any circumstances exporting their economic or political model. The West does that by default. And, but Russia and China do not do that. They don't say you're going to be sanctioned because of you're violating our sense of, uh, of truth or, or, or some kind of Western value. They just say that's what you do. We do something different. That's a, that's a really big difference that Western audiences and think tanks don't want to recognize. Go ahead, Earl. That's absolutely true, Peter. It's, um, you don't see Russia and China kind of imposing their own political structure upon uh, people. And, and especially with Central Asia, and I just, uh, it was in uh, their last year speaking, the, uh, there's huge opportunities with the Belt and Road Initiative. And, and Russia's uh, uh, historical relations with them the, uh, plays a critical role as well. And uh, they're looking for economic development. And they're not looking for military, they're not looking for someone to tell them what kind of government to have, but they're looking for economic development. And this is where I think you see this partnership uh, between uh, Russia and China coming into play that you really put in and, and the role of the uh, Eurasia Economic Union plays a, a role in this as well um, you've got a, a whole pathway uh, that Belt and Road Initiative because yes is there is there objectives for China for it yes but but in general it's going to provide huge economic development opportunities raising millions of people out yeah. of poverty yeah. um, 
and providing new opportunities a across that whole region. And that's a very, as well as providing stability. So I think the important thing is they want stability and they want to encourage a natural growth uh, for these countries in that area. Jim, Peter, Jim, 10 years from now, America's going to wake up and say, oh my gosh, look what's happened. The Chinese and the Russians have one belt, one row. They have pipelines. They have labor agreements. The Russians are not big debtors like the U.S. is. The Chinese are huge creditors. America's the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. What is this? that we're pushing those two together. Uh, what is, the people in Washington just have no clue about China and they have no clue about Russia. And all of us are going to suffer. Well, I think there's an answer to that, Jim. And let me go to Joel in, in Paris. The military industrial complex. I mean, read what the Pentagon has been saying uh, since the beginning of uh, this year. I mean, with, with their uh, position papers. I mean, that's just the gravy train. It's the gravy train. We got another enemy now, and they're together. Oh, my goodness. The sky is falling. We need more money, more military, more expenditures. Because as we've all pointed out on this program, when China and Russia will be building the hugest in, in, infrastructure Structure projects, probably in the history of, of humanity, uh, all across the Eurasian landmass, the United States is, its its infrastructure will continue to crumble and will waste money on the military on a threat that they hope they will never have to honor, and that means going to war with two of the most important countries on the planet. That explains everything. It's stupid at its core, but it explains it. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, maybe here I would take the liberty to answer as a French, because in France we do also have a military industry. Now, it's true that uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, the military complex in, in the U.S. has increasingly served its own interest, looking for a commercial attitude. Now, a military complex can also serve as a driver for innovation, and I think that, at least for China, the military complex is there to help Chinese renaissance, uh, Chinese developing new uh, the Chinese companies developing new technologies, by being able to to have a divide, a frontier that what's military, what it's uh, dual technology, and what's uh, what's civilian. Mm. I, I, I know less about about the Russian system, but I think it's about, and I think you're very true. Uh, it's about the, uh, the the American military system or military complex to be maybe kind of reshuffled or re-regulated by the politicians in D.C., in the Congress and or the White House. And I think that's very, that's damn important for the sustainability of the international relations. I would just want to add one thing on Central Asia. A few countries are, are very, uh, very strategic, like Kazakhstan. I think Kazakhstan yeah. is very illustrative of how the yep. two countries, China and Russia, have worked together. Yep. Uh, you know, yep. analysts have explored whether the two countries would disagree on the trains going through and etc. And they've agreed. And for the shared interest and for the interest of Kazakhstan and development, maybe the next landlock, maybe the next problem would be, uh, would be Ukraine, where here, uh, of course, the Russian position is slightly different. Okay, yeah, but I mean, one, Earl, you know, one can make the argument, and I've heard this many, many times, is that the reason to overthrow the government in Ukraine in 2014 was to obstruct this the, the this uh, whole Eurasian landmass development. They wanted to pull Ukraine out of it and pull it into the Western orbit. Uh, Hillary Clinton, the worst uh, Secretary of State in history, said this actually in, co in Congress. But I want to slightly change gears here. Earl, one of the other things that's happening here, as Russia and China gravitate towards each other, we also have these uh, two, uh, technological competition that, that Joel has been uh, mentioning, is that what we can, will get is a dual internet. We'll have dual technologies. We have to be on one platform or another. And I think that mm. there's a lot of people in Washington are terrified that people will choose the Eastern platform. And I mean, from ev everything you can imagine, telephones, computers, uh, computers telecommunicate, everything, okay? It's like the difference between Android and an OS, okay? Okay, they'll be different, and they don't want to see Russia and China leading that, because that will be a major technological challenge to the supremacy of the West. What do you think, Earl? Well, I think uh, there are obviously going to be bridges across, and I think it's important to keep bridges, those gateways across. But, but there is, um, obviously there's a concern, uh, and you can see this bearing out with the Huawei, uh, um, you know, um, aggression that's going on uh, towards them. Um, always leading uh, technology in 5G. 5G is the next area for communications infrastructure. 
uh, it enables so much more expansion, new developments for corporations and startups and capabilities. And, and now you've seen now uh, uh, you've got um, Russia, Russian companies now are going to be developing software for Huawei's mobile because they're getting yep. cut off from Android. Russia is now cooperating with them on a 5G infrastructure projects. So you've got uh, that's going to be an enabler for a new uh, communications high-speed infrastructure. And and yeah, you've got uh, there. There's overlap. They interoperate, operate, but I think they want to be independent in case they get cut off. In case something happens, you can be independent and you can till still continue to operate. Um, and that and and that throws. That throws it. There's a. I'll tell you where the security threat is for for Huawei. It's not them tapping into anything. It's our ability not to tap into the, some of their networks. That's where the concern is. I think more so, <laughs> as well as uh, trade and competition. <laughs> that's right. One 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 power spying is better than another. That's really incredible. Uh, that's that that's called <laughs> that's called exceptionalism gone berserk. But anyway, Jim, you want to jump in? Go ahead. Peter, you need to see not just technology, but finance as well. Yep. You know, the Russians and the Chinese and others, the Indians, are coming up with a new competition to the American financial system. There will be a new World Bank. There will be a new IMF, because the Americans, if they don't like you, they cut you off from the U.S. dollar. Well, the Chinese and the Russians and the Brazilians and the Indians say, wait a minute, this is an absurd system. So now America is forcing a new World Bank, a new IMF, a new everything, and then the U.S. dollar will no longer have its supremacy because we have abused ourselves. It's going to build up a whole new competitive financial system, not just technology. Okay, Joel, let, let, let's just, sure. I, I want to have a, a parenthetical here. What would it take for, because this is what you constantly hear in think ta uh, the think tanks, you know, what would it take to entice Russia to turn westward again? What would it have? To, what would have to happen? Okay, like uh, sanction relief, all these kinds of things here. I'm just trying to imagine a scenario where you can reverse the trends that have been going on uh, for a couple of decades now. What could stop this trend of Russia and China getting closer and closer together? Go ahead, in Paris. Well, you know, I think the answer to your question lies in the fact that there's nothing like the West, e e either in finance, in currencies, in trade, or in technology. There's nothing like the West. There's the USA, uh, there's some countries in Europe, there's the EU, there are, you know, some Eastern European countries not part of the EU. Th there's not a West. And the question is whether we see a West, in which case that will antagonize Russia, or if we see a gradation of Western countries, in which case Russia can have its, it, it, its space and, and place, you know? Now, this is too generic an answer, but if we get to the specifics, for instance, technology, for instance, uh, energies, it, I think in technology we, we, we're going to be cool. Uh, taking for, talking from a European perspective, the Europeans are not quite there in the 5G. That's okay. We are there in batteries. We are there in new electric vehicles, I think Russia could have the same perspective of trying to have different alliances, different technological and economic partnerships with different countries. So I think it's all natural for China and Russia to get closer, for Russia to go towards China as a close neighbor, sharing some interests, as I said. But on all the fronts, technology, finance, uh, I think the Eurozone uh, or some parts of the EU can be natural uh, partners as well. So. It's not so much, I would say, of a, a science fiction uh, 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 scenario. I think it's about the world getting really, uh, really multilateral, like deeply, truly multilateral, not multilateral the U.S. way. Okay, well, that's a very good point because it, there is a vision for a multilateral world, but it has a hegemon. The alternative is there is not a hegemon, and it is based on competition. And I think that's what the Russians and Chinese are, are gunning for. I would that's, say it's that's, so. I'm sorry. You know, that's, we, I'm sorry. We've run for, out of time, for gentlemen. The last, for the last we've 15. run out of time here. At yeah. the, many thanks to my guests okay. in Paris, Washington, and in Singapore. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.